Douglas said, a patriot, a true lover of his country, is one who rebukes and does not excuse the sins of the nation. That's biblical definition of, of what it is to love and to bless, right? And it seems that somebody like Frederick Douglass, he, he got it right, but that idea has been perverted so that you have people now who accuse uh, the nation of its sins, but don't ever seem to want them to be righted. They seem to be in love with making the accusation for its own sake, in a sense, damning the country rather than loving and blessing the country, damning the country uh, without the hope that it could return to its ideals. Whereas Douglas is a figure who he didn't he didn't shrink from the criticism, but he clearly believed, as did Dr. King, that uh, we we were obliged to repent, we're obliged to go back to where we had uh, started. The idea being. Was slavery uh, an original idea or was it an aberration of the ideas of the, of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence? Frederick Douglass, rightly, I believe, comes out to the side of say, that says, this was an aberration. This is a cancer on the body politic and social. It is not inherent to, it is a contradiction of. And his ability to affirm that, and once again, to make a distinction between government or policy and the values and foundational ideas of a nation. Today, we face the same issue. You, I, others are at the moment critical of government policy, of things that the current administration or others have done over time. That is different than uh, a, another form of attack, which is the ideological attack by people who do not love this country, who do not have its best interests at heart, who would like to see the experiment fail and for this country to become something else. Michael Wilkerson, welcome to Socrates in the studio. Thank you, Eric. Great to be with you. Um, you do a lot. You write a lot. Stormwall.org, is it? Stormwall.com. Stormwall.com. But I want to talk to you today. You, you wrote a book. We have a copy here called Why America Matters. The Case for a New Exceptionalism. Um, I read the book, Why America Matters, and I was um, mightily, mightily impressed at your ability uh, to tell what's essentially the history of the United States in, in a way that helps us see not just why America matters and, and why America is unavoidably exceptional, but how that should help us process the present moment. So uh, I, I wanna talk to you, start at the beginning. What led you to take on this monumental project? This, uh, the, the, why did you write Why America Matters? Anger, I think, and I say that uh, facetiously, but I, I think over the last few years, there was a growing proverbial fire in the bones. There was this uh, recognition that we as a, as a country, as a nation, as a people had gone so far away from what I think America sh was about and should be about that uh, I felt almost compelled to, to write it. It turned out to be, a, as you pointed out, a much bigger, broader work than I had ever imagined. And I am not a uh, author or journalist by background. I spent most of my career in, in business and finance. I'd been on Wall Street for a decade. In the decade leading up to the lockdowns and pandemic 2020, I was running a company investing in businesses in Africa, mostly in food security, energy security. So I, I had only begun to write in 2020 when all of a sudden, lockdowns, travel restrictions, I can't do the commuter flight to Nairobi or Johannesburg anymore. And I have to actually start to pay attention, not to African politics, which I had gotten to know quite a bit, but to what was happening here in, in my own country. And what struck me in 2020 was how different uh, the country felt, how different the dialogue felt, how different uh, things felt. And I, and I began to write uh, op-eds, just simple contributing to various 
uh, journal, uh, journals or publications, starting out with the business or economic perspective, what I knew, but the impact of, uh, of, of lockdowns, what I saw happening. But the more I began to dig in and the more my then teenage sons began to ask me very hard questions about what was going on around us, did I start to do my own research, start to dig in more deeply. And I think for the first time in my life, I came to a strong conviction that fake news was real, that what was happening around us was uh, not an accident, that uh, there was a conspiracy of uh, misinformation, of propaganda, of censorship, that the more I dug, the more I realized was much, much worse than I ever imagined possible. And it is, I mean, let's be honest, it, it was for anybody very difficult to process. You don't want to think that what you fear could conceivably be true is actually true. And, and, and I think that, um, uh, you know, there, there are people I'm sure listening right now who uh, are at different places on that, on the continuum. But um, I, I think it's because it is so disturbing to think that in the United States of America, this could be happening uh, and or, or to think that we have actually drifted so far from our roots, from the founder's vision, because, you know, the question why America matters, you're presupposing that there is such a thing as America, that there is an idea that it's not, it, it does, it, in other words, if, the, if there weren't um, this ideal um, of America, then, you, you know, why America, you couldn't ask the question why America matters. So you have to ask what is America to understand, it, it, or, or to, you have to ask what is America to understand is there such a thing as America? And that's really what you do in the book. I mean, the first part of the book is, is the history. And it really is just so beautifully done. Uh, one of the reasons that I recommend it to people is because you, you, you tell our history very beautifully, succinctly, uh, to the extent that it can be told succinctly. But l let's go through it, because you did determine when, when you are asking the question, is America exceptional, or how have we drifted from the idea of exceptionalism? W we have to kind of go back. But before we do that, yeah. was there an inciting incident for you? Was it, uh, d did you, do you remember when um, President Obama was asked whether America is exceptional, and he gave a very tortured um, kind of answer. I thought that was a that was a moment. That was a big deal. That was a milestone in America to have the American president unable clearly to say, "Yes, we are exceptional. Here's why." Um, did did that hit you at the time, or did it hit you more recently? It hit me at the time, and then I moved on because I was busy with other things. And and it was interesting. Even President Trump, as as uh, candidate Trump in 2016 didn't necessarily embrace the idea. He kind of said, well, I never really liked the term. And, and from candidate Trump to President Trump, and certainly by uh, his fourth year of his first term, he, it shifted quite a bit where he was embracing the idea that no, no. Uh, and I think part of what was happening for him and for me, making a distinction between the United States as a country, as a nation state, and America as a nation, as a people, as an idea, as, as you said, and what, what, what fascinated me about talking about why America matters and the idea of exceptionalism was the idea that America is a special place goes all the way back to the very first generation of settlers, the Puritans, uh, the Pilgrims and others. And John Winthrop, uh, who was the captain of the ship that came over starting uh, the, uh, the, the Massachusetts Bay Colony Company, basically express this idea that whatever we're doing, and we don't know what it is yet, the, the eyes of the world are upon us because we're, we're trying to create something new that hasn't existed before, a place of religious freedom, a political freedom. And he quoted Jesus to say, we can be as a city on a hill, a shining example. But if we fail, the eyes of the world are, are also upon us and we will be a byword, a, a mockery among the nations of the world. And that theme is something as a metaphor, the city on a hill that I open the book with and start and, and, and talk about how all the way from uh, 
Kennedy to Reagan and then eventually to President Trump embrace this idea that we are a city on a hill, that there is something extraordinary about the history of America. And you can talk about, uh, uh, let's say, exceptionalism in the sense that we, the largest country in the world, all the natural resources, it is that, but it's so much more. It goes to the foundational ideas that were unique or at least unpracticed at the time, unprecedented. I don't, I don't think we want to leave people with the, with the idea that this was all settled, you know, uh, until recent times. In other words, that you, you can go back in our own history and you can trace, you know, uh, you know, whether it was, whether people were um, identifying as Americans with the, uh, with Jamestown, or with Plymouth, or with the Boston Bay, you you see that, and nobody um, saw more clearly the exceptionalism of America than President Lincoln. Uh, we're sitting in a room here, surrounded by uh, Lincoln memorabilia. Lincoln, and I wrote about this in my book, if you can keep it, but he really dramatically understood this idea. Uh, you know, he was the one that uh, initiated the idea of Thanksgiving. I mean, to look back to Plymouth as this founding moment in this idea that was to become America. And so you, you have that working its way through our history. And of course, we've had people that have gotten it and not gotten it. But but Lincoln, to me, is, is a really, really key figure. Um, but of course, uh, the idea of, of American exceptionalism and America on the founder's model really basically held sway. I mean, you have obviously Reagan um, m making his point about it, but it's what, what caused you to write the book, of course, is that it's it's come under particular attack in in recent years. Um, and I, I want to I want to talk about that. But I also want to I want to talk about your telling of the history, because it's really like why America matters, the case for new exceptionalism. It's it's really two books. The first book is the history, and then, and then you go on. But, but I love your telling of it. Uh, can we dilate for a minute on, on some of the, the moments? Yeah, and, and so you, you said a, a number of things that really caught my attention is that one of the things that began to happen around uh, the first half of the 19th century was this realization that there, uh, an identity was coalescing around Puritan New England, around the ideals that had come out of that. There has always been a tension in American history, let's call it, between uh, the Puritan founding and, you alluded to it, the Jamestown founding of, of 1619, which was purely commercial, it was purely about the slave trade and commerce, where what was happening in New England was about religious liberty. It was about leaving a place of political persecution, of ec uh, economic depression and all sorts of things, of wars, religious persecution. The pilgrims have been wandering around to the Netherlands and everywhere else trying to find a place to be able to practice freely. And even you mentioned the era of, of Lincoln. So by the time of the Civil War, one of the most fascinating characters that I really discovered as I was researching Why America Matters was Frederick Douglass. Uh, this gentleman, born a slave, taught himself to read, escaped, freed, went north, and eventually becomes this prophetic voice to America. A man who, as a young man, was angry at the country, rightly so, because of the injustice done to him, but eventually becomes a true patriot, someone who, was, as, he, as he read and discovered the ideals of the country, the foundational ideas, the ideas embedded in the Declaration of Independence that all men were created equal and endowed with unalienable God-given rights that could not be taken away or abridged by any government. Frederick Douglass begins to speak in the uh, 1830s, eight, that's a little early, 1840s, 1850s, about the coming catastrophe and identifying slavery as the issue that would eventually come right because in God's eternal justice, it could not stand. It was immoral. And if there were a God in heaven, then slavery would have to be righted. But the, the, the danger was that it was only going to be righted through bloodshed. Douglas said, a patriot, a true lover of his country, is one who rebukes 
and does not excuse the sins of the nation. I, I turned right to the page when you were talking. I, I, I remember that uh, you begin the book with a, a, with a number. It. Maybe you can read well, it Well, no, better. you begin the book with a number of epigrams, one by Tocqueville, one Montesquieu, uh, the book of Proverbs, and then Frederick Douglass. No, you quoted it correctly. You said, he, he is the lover of his country who rebukes and does not excuse its sins. That's biblical definition of, of what it is to love and to bless, right? And it seems that somebody like Frederick Douglass, he, he got it right, but that idea has been perverted so that you have people now who accuse uh, the nation of its sins, but don't ever seem to want them to be righted. They seem to be in love with making the accusation for its own sake, in a sense, damning the country rather than loving and blessing the country, damning the country uh, without the hope that it could return to its ideals. Whereas Douglas is a figure who he didn't he didn't shrink from the criticism, but he clearly believed, as did Dr. King, that uh, we we were obliged to repent, were obliged to go back to where we had uh, started. The idea being. Was slavery uh, an original idea or was it an aberration of the ideas of the, of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence? Frederick Douglass, rightly, I believe, comes out to the side of say, that says, this was an aberration. This is a cancer on the body politic and social. It is not inherent to, it is a contradiction of. And his ability to affirm that, and once again, to make a distinction between government or policy and the values and foundational ideas of a nation. Today, we face the same issue. You, I, others are at the moment critical of government policy, of things that the current administration or others have done over time. That is different than uh, a, another form of attack, which is the ideological attack by people who do not love this country, who do not have its best interests at heart, who would like to see the experiment fail and for this country to become something else. There's differences in motivation, differences in approach. But I, I, I would say that part of it has been, part of the attack has been to confuse the ideas of, is patriotism even a good thing? Is nationalism a good thing? Is it okay to love your country? And we have been, we'll talk about perhaps later the, the broader ideological attack, but that's certainly been one of them, ha, has been to make Americans feel somewhat ashamed of who they are, of who their country is, uh, to be ashamed of its history. Now, it's hard to be proud of your history if you actually don't know it. And one of the problems I identify in this book is that we're in this massive generational shift where starting with the millennials, but especially then as you go to uh, Gen Z and younger, that they are simply not being taught uh, their own history, they're not being taught civics. If they're being taught a history of America, it is a completely distorted view. They're not being told the truth. They're being taught a propagandized version based on postmodernism, based on critical theory, uh, and, an un and, and Marxism, an underlying desire to undermine the foundations of, of our nation. Right. And your, your argument is not just that it's an alternative uh, vision of what America is and has been, but it's actually general, genuinely wrong. And so the first part of your book, you, 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 you tell the, the true story, in a sense, of America and, and, and of why that would lead us to think that there is such a thing as America, why there's an ideal and why it actually matters, why we shouldn't burn it down, but why we should restore it to the original vision. So let, let's go a little bit through the history. I mean, you okay. started with Winthrop uh, in the 17th century, but, but uh, talk us a little bit through uh, th through the history, and I know you write about Jackson at some point, but yeah. what are some of the high points? And slow me down if I'm going too fast as a question, because I know we have a limited amount of time. It's There's a lot of content in here, but what I would say is that think about, um, so we start with that Puritan era, Winthrop, this is 1600s, New England, there's also some settlements in Virginia and elsewhere, as we've talked about. And over the next hundred years, you see a real development of the states with individual identities, identities growing. And then something interesting happens in the mid uh, 1700s, the 18th century, something we call now the Great Awakening. Well, there's this, for the next generation that hadn't come to, uh, to America, they're now second or third generation. They had lost a little bit of that religious motivation and fervor, 
But then there's a, a the so-called great awakening, this massive revival and reflection of the importance of religion in public life. And all of these commentators, you mentioned Tocqueville, but others, German, uh, Charles Dickens from the UK, who would come and w common thread for all of them is this amazement at how important religion and faith was in public life. Because public it wasn't dialogue. the case it was in no Europe, longer, had it, and they noticed been. it. It was no longer. And because, the, because religion was established in e Europe, they weren't, they weren't used to seeing it run free. And to see it run free, I mean, Tocqueville marveled at it. They, I mean, they all marvel at it because they, it, it is pretty distinctly American. So you have that. You have the Great Awakening, the spiritual revival. At the same moment where in Europe, all the ideals of the Enlightenment are really coming into uh, fruition, into maturity. And those, are make, those ideals are making their way across the pond, across the Atlantic. And those ideals in the Enlightenment had to do with things like the idea of liberty, the ideas that individuals had rights, that sovereignty was vested not in a monarch, not in, in, in the political power, but in the people. In Europe, those ideas did not mix very well. The French Revolution, contemporaneous with ours, was extremely bloody. The, 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 the battle between republicanism and uh, monarchy and history, including religion, was to sever any ties with religion. But that doesn't happen in America. Something different happens. Somehow there's this beautiful harmony between the Enlightenment ideals, Scottish, European, continental European or otherwise, with American religious uh, fervor. But it, and I think we have to you know, say it clearly. It's because of religious liberty in America, because there was no established church. I mean, if you have an established Catholic church in France, you can understand why uh, people who hated the monarchy saw the monarchy as wedded to the establishment church. It was a source of power. Uh, it was an institution, whereas in the United States, there was no such thing. There was no established church. It was absolutely free. And it was men like Thomas Jefferson, not an Orthodox Christian by any sense, a deist, one who believed in some sort of God, but uh, who was the one who said, uh, it's, it's one of the things I talked about in the book is that we've twisted Jefferson now to, to say that he says separation of church and state, meaning we have to keep the church out of the state, religion out of politics. That is not at all what he said. It's not at all what he meant. I mean, it's literally the opposite it's of the what he, opposite. Yeah, which is a shocking thing. He, Jefferson said, we do not want to impose the state upon religious liberties. We don't want the state in the churches financially supporting them, ordaining or appointing ministers. The idea was to ensure that minority religions, Christian religions, would flourish without the heavy hand of the state, which we'd seen in, uh, in continental Europe. It was never intended to keep faith or religion or spirituality, spirituality out of the public square or uh, politics. And it was clearly the opposite. And in the 20th century, through the Supreme Court and other processes, that has been, as you said, completely inverted to mean the opposite of what it was intended to mean. Father Richard John Newhouse uh, in 1984 wrote a book called The Naked Public Square where he deals with this. He spoke at Socrates in the City, uh, it's got to be about 15 years ago now, but he saw that when you get this wrong uh, and when you, when, you, when you don't think that it's, uh, you know, the idea of the separation of church and state is to keep the state away from the church, to keep the church free, but you yeah. invert it and you say, no, 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 it's to keep the idea of God or religion or faith away from anything we do in civic life, that you get yeah. the naked public square and you get a, a, a enforced secularism, which undermines everything the founders knew yeah. necessary to genuine liberty. That's absolutely right. And so what, what happens now, we're now, let's say, mid-1700s on the eve of the Revolutionary War. Those two streams of ideas are coming together. They're finding uh, a way to operate, I'm saying the Enlightenment and the, and, and the Christian faith, a rejuvenated faith. And it forms the basis for the founders' ideals. So, for example, from the Enlightenment comes Montesquieu's idea from the spirit of the laws about the, the necessity of the separation of powers, that you had to keep the executive separate from the legislative, separate from the judicial. Why? Because power checks power. And that was the only way 
that you were going to have a, a balance of power that would keep the nation from devolving into tyranny, which was the great fear of that generation of leaders. They'd seen tyrannical oppression. They were experiencing it from the British colonial overlords. They'd seen it in other countries in Europe. And all of the ideas that James Madison and others express in the Declaration in particular and in the Constitution, again, this idea that all men are created equal, uh, endued with unalienable rights that cannot be taken away or abridged by government, the ideas of the rule of law, that uh, no king was sovereign over, uh, sorry, above the law. Everyone was equal under the law. And fundamental idea that had been around for a long time but wasn't in practice really anywhere. Uh, the ideas of private property, what they described as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, the pursuit of happiness was this idea that you were free to enjoy what was yours, your land, your home, your possessions, your family, without the government coming in and taking any of those things away from you. The idea of the pursuit of happiness, if you look it up today in one of these contributive dictionaries, it's like the right to do whatever you want, as long as it's not illegal and it doesn't hurt anybody. That is not at all what they meant. The pursuit of happiness was... Uh, connected to the idea of virtue. It was a life well lived, but it, before it was written, pursuit of happiness in the, in, in, in the Declaration, it was the idea of the, the, uh, the, the right to private property, to, to have what you, the, the fruit of your labor, that the government would not take it away from you, as we see under any kind of authoritarianism or 20th century communism or 21st century America, we could argue as well, but let's come back to that later and say, that the idea that government had a wall, they were not allowed to encroach on your, uh, on your home, uh, even the Fourth Amendment under uh, unlawful searches and, seizure, and seizures, that they could not come and take something without due process, without uh, warrant. All of those things were, were related ideas to the idea of the individual having sovereignty, having uh, the ability to um, protect him or herself from the tyrannical oppression of government. So yeah, there was a healthy fear uh, of tyranny um, because it was so fresh. People had experienced tyranny. The founders had all experienced it under King George III. Um, and that, that carries on. But it's interesting because even Lincoln uh, in his Lyceum speech in 1838, I mean, it's amazing. He's, what, 29 years old. And he delivers this extraordinary speech uh, already in 1838, understanding that most of the revolutionary generation was dying out or had died out. And they were beginning to struggle with, uh, you know, because they, had, because they hadn't lived through it with these ideas. And he felt the need, again, in 1838, a very long time before he becomes president, um, to try to reestablish what is America. And he, he's writing in 1838 about American exceptionalism and about how if we are to be destroyed, again, this is in 1838, it's amazing, that it's going to have to be by our own hand. And he talks about the silent artillery of time. Os Guinness wrote a book about it called A Free People's Suicide. But he is already seeing the danger of forgetting what we once all knew and how it has to be rehearsed over and over so that we, d so that we don't forget it, not knowing that he himself would play a central role in that uh, a couple of decades in, in the future. But it's fascinating to me that this goes back so far that to forget yeah. the founder's vision was already a problem in the 1830s. And in the 1830s, that generation was really coalescing around the idea of America. In other words, if you go back to the Revolutionary War, people more identified with their state. I'm from Connecticut. I'm from uh, Virginia. Wherever it was, that was the stronger identity. By Lincoln's generation, this was shifting. There was a, an American myth. There was this, a story we tell ourselves about who we are. And, and it was a really beautiful thing, but he could see already, and by the way, even the previous generation could see that if we can't keep the union together, if we can't figure out a way to get these colonies very different in nature and aspirations to work together in a union, we would be prey to our foreign adversaries. They saw it during the Revolutionary War. We had the British Empire fighting the French Empire, using, the, uh, using America, the Americas as, as a battleground, trying to claim territory, seeing the vast wealth. The founding fathers knew 
Lincoln knew. If you didn't hold together the nation as a as a nation as a union, Amer that we would be we would be overwhelmed, divided, we would fall. You'll never have to look in the pantry for dinner again. DoorDash. During the Continental Congress, when they were trying to figure out what is going to go in the Constitution, the states were so divided that they made a terrible compromise on the issue of slavery. They couldn't hold the center. And the compromise pleased no one because the, the, the southern states were threatening to walk out of the Union altogether. The majority in the North decided, it, for that reason that I just explained, it was better to make a compromise and, and bring the South keep the South in the, in the, in the union of the, of the country rather than have them walk. And so rather than eliminate slavery altogether, which is what a lot in the North wanted, uh, John Adams, uh, and, uh, and others who were advocating Benjamin Franklin, uh, who wanted to get slavery explicitly banned through the constitution, they compromised and they didn't do it thinking that it would die under its own weight, that it was just such an evil thing that it would just, it would go away of its own power. Well, obviously that didn't happen. And the, the problem festered. So by the time the 1830s, when Abraham Lincoln is making that speech that you referenced, Andrew Jackson is in the White House and he faces uh, a crisis of, of South Carolina trying to set the stage to leave the Union already. It's called the nullification crisis. And they were basically uh, created an act that said, whatever the federal government does, we can always nullify it. We can, we can, I'm simplifying, but we can basically state sovereignty we can take whatever federal law we don't like and nullify it and say that the state is, is sovereign. Well, Jackson recognized that this was step one towards their true aim, which was to succeed from the Union. They could see the writing on the wall. They could see the conflict with slavery. They wanted out South Carolina. Other states would follow. So Jackson was effective because he, he stood his ground and he declared treason. He said that this is an insurrection, armed insurrection. It's going to send uh, federal forces. Eventually, uh, John Calhoun was, the, uh, was in the Senate at the time uh, leading this charge. He had been Jackson's vice president and betrayed him and went down this uh, rebellious path. But Jackson uh, stood his ground and South Carolina backed off. So Lincoln then credited Jackson 20 years later with having at least forestalled the Civil War and given at least an opportunity for two decades to try to see if there was another way out other than massive bloodshed. Ultimately, it failed, but uh, this was on the path. I mean, it is uh, interesting to me that we're sitting in the Union League Club, founded uh, in 1860. Um, because of Abraham Lincoln and because uh, whether we could keep the Union together was uh, a, a central moment, uh, there's a, a lock of John Brown's hair about uh, 18 feet from where I'm sitting. There's a lot of history here. But most of us have forgotten the history. What you just said about uh, the battle between John C. Calhoun and Jackson, I didn't know that until I read your book. So there's a lot of stuff in the book. Uh, I'm, how, how did you ferret these things out? In other words, what was it that made you, just in that case, because yeah. I thought everyone should know this. I'm glad you wrote about it, and I hope people will read Why America Matters. But how did you stumble on it and realize that it was so important? 